Okay, so we have already looked at one method of argumentation, um, and there actually are multiple methods uh, and others that you'll read about uh, this week, you know, it, with from your readings and also learn about through the lectures. And so one of the other methods is the Tolman method of argumentation. And so that's what we're going to look at now. So who is Tolman? So it's actually a man's last name. His name is Stephen Tolman. Uh, he was a British contemporary philosopher and he redefined how we think of argument. So what you see on top is like the classic argument method. Um, it was a three part structure and it was uh, structured like that. And so that is the way it was typically done um, for a long period of time. And then Tolman had a different idea and he came up with his own method um, for argument. And it looks like on the bottom where you have those seven, diff seven different pieces. And we'll go through each of those to learn what they are and how you form them, etc. So the different pieces of the Tolman method are claim, reasons, support, warrant, backing, rebuttal, and qualifier. So let's look at the first one, claim. So what it does, it organizes your argument. It's a single statement uh, where everything else in your argument attaches to it. So when you're trying to figure out what your claim is, you need to ask, what's my point? What am I trying to prove? So an example is consumers should buy organic fair trade bananas because of the high humanitarian and environmental cost of marketing traditional bananas. So that is the claim. It's also a thesis. So next thing, reasons. What your reasons do. <laughs> um, they direct support for your claim. They often function as topic sentences or the main idea. So to figure out what your reason is, you ask what comes after because. OK, so you had previously about uh, the fair trade with bananas because why? And then what comes after because is your reason or are your reasons. So, for example, most workers on traditional banana plantations labor under unsafe conditions. So because, and then it gives the reason there. The next is support. What it does, it defends your reasons. You use logos, ethos, and pathos to support uh, your reasons. You vary your support, but logical support, the, um, the logos, that's the really strong proof. And it sh really shows that you've done your research. That's, you know, a really strong area. So you need to ask to figure out what your support is. You need to ask, how will I prove my point? So examples of support are logical support can include your facts, figures, stats, any commentary that describes the conditions, um, specifically the conditions with the banana plantations. Uh, the next would be ethical support includes scholarly articles and research from credible online print sources about those conditions and emotional support. You can add that piece in there as well. So emotional support focuses on your decision to switch to organized fair trade bananas. And it describes the conditions and examples from the experience of the workers themselves. The next is warrant. So what does a warrant do? It identifies the shared values and beliefs with an audience and shared morals that help the audience listen. And I think this key part uh, with the warrant is really something that sets Tolman's method apart from other argumentative methods. 
So it's really trying to find that common ground with your audience to kind of, it's kind of like extending a hand and, um, you know, finding just common footing and then they might be more apt to listen. So to find your warrant, you need to ask, will my audience believe me based on the values we share and how can I justify my claim? So an example, the fair treatment of workers and good stewardship of the environment are important to the global economy. That would be assuming um, or knowing that your audience cares about, um, you know, the economy and, you know, perhaps even just like the, the treatment and good stewardship aspect as well. So if someone does not care one bit about the economy, that's not going to um, affect them. So that is another part of knowing your audience and writing specifically to your audience. The next is backing. So what it does, it supports the warrant and you bring it in when you feel you need to back the warrant to help persuade your audience. So you ask what additional support for my warrant will I need to help persuade my audience? So an example support for this warrant uh, that we had can include examples of the increasing number of importers that will buy bananas only from companies that guarantee workers' rights and environmental standards or commentary of economists who view fair trade as essential to the global economy. So all of those would be good pieces of backing. So think of backing as literally backing up the warrant. The next, the rebuttal. So what it does, it argues against your claim it presents a different or an opposing point of view. And you need to ask what points of view different from mine should I bring into my argument? So remember, you don't want to focus a whole bunch on the rebuttal um, just because you want everything to, you want the focus of the entire paper or argument to be about your points but you always know that there will be the naysayers or the people who don't agree and they'll be asking, you know, they'll be cynical or just genuinely asking questions in their head. Well, what about A, B or C? So you have to think ahead on some of those things. So for example, major banana exporters argue they comply with the social accountability, 8,000 uh, labor and human rights standards. So it's a standard that they have for, um, that area. So major banana exporters will say, well, we, we already do this. So that's the rebuttal you're thinking of. So then you think, okay, well, how would I respond to that? 100% um, compliance with the Rainforest Alliance, with the Rainforest Alliance's banana cert certification program designed to protect workers from excessive heat exposure to pesticides and to the pricey environment from pollution and deforestation among other requirements. So that's another you know, um, thing that someone else would be saying, okay, well, we also, we do this as well. So we already, we have 100% compliance with this area as well. So those are things that you'd be thinking about what other points of view that people make could be presented there. So then you have the qualifier. So what it does, it prevents you from making absolute statements because they use words such as often, typically, and in most cases. And you know, that helps your audience be able to listen to you if, if you're using words like that. So you don't want to say all um, banana you know, exporters and people who work on all the owners of the banana farms, they all do this. OK, because I mean, that would mean you have to back it up that literally all of them do that. And it makes when you have the absolute statements like that, the all or nothing kind of thing, then that is definitely a red flag for um, the argument being flawed or not being accurate. So if you have these qualifiers, if you have words like many of the banana plantations do this or often 
the banana plantations do this or typically. So it, it leaves room for those exceptions. So you need to ask, how can I modify the language in my argument, especially with reference to my claim and reasons to make it more believable? And examples of words that you can use most, many, often, often can. All of those are good ones, too, as long as they're not absolute. So if you think about when you were young, if your parents said, you never clean your room. And you probably would think that's not true. I often don't clean my room, but never that's not true. And then it kind of erases and negates every time that you did do it like you're supposed to, because there were a couple of times that you didn't. So just think about like the animosity you might have felt at that point in time or irritation and stuff like that. So that is what you want to avoid by using the qualifiers. So like I said previously about the cool thing with Tolman and it sets him apart is trying to find that common ground because he is super audience centered with his approach. Um, and it's really a great strength of his and his whole method, the whole focus is towards the audience. Everything is built around the audience. So at any step, ask yourself this question and it will kind of help you with building your Tolman argument. So how does this part of my argument move my audience closer to accepting my claim. If you keep your audience front and center through each step, then that will help. Because just like with the whole cleaning your room when you were young scenario, you don't want to offend them, right? Um, and if you are not keeping your audience in mind for an argument, then what's the point of even arguing, correct? Because they are the ones that you're trying to convince. So they have to be front and center. So to get started with Tolman, you have these different steps to do. So number one, you need to ask what issue will you argue, what issue will you argue on? Why is it important to you? What might you claim? And that kind of helps you work through that. The second thing you do is you figure out what reasons can you use to support your claim? The third thing you do is you ask what support will you use to prove your reasons? So like evidence and stuff, specifically what kinds of logical, ethical and emotional appeals will you use for your audience? Using an array of all three of them is optimal, but especially with argument, you need to strongly rely on the logical aspect, but don't forget the emotional. That is really where people can, or humans in general, can really have their um, their heartstrings tugged on. And one thing that I want to note with using those different types of appeals, obviously logos, the logical aspect, uh, using those facts and figures, you know, those are facts you cannot argue with them, right? Remember they're not opinion. Um, and if, Things are, you know, what they say, black and white or on paper and all of that. You can form opinions about them, but you can't change the facts. So that is a absolutely solid uh, backing um, or piece of evidence to use. So definitely rely on that. The ethos part, the ethical part. Also, it's very important. But if you don't have facts, if you don't have the logos, then that really uh, takes away from your argument. And lastly, the emotional part. Yes, emotions are definitely a driving force for people, uh, for humans and how we operate, but you cannot be emotional driven without any facts. Um, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, you might have heard the term sensationalism. So that's where you just get people up and going or you get them arguing about something or believing strongly in a certain way just because you got their emotions up. You got them really angry or 
really just fired up internally, but there literally is no backing behind it. There's no logic. There is no proof of anything, but the emotions are so overcoming. So you don't want to rely too heavily on that because then that does lead into uh, kind of mistakes, which we will talk about, uh, like with logical fallacies. 